Okay. Um, good morning again from Washington, D.C. My name is Dr. Anwar Buhars, and I am a professor of counterterrorism and counter and violent extremism at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Uh, I want to extend a very uh, warm welcome to the many Africa Center alumni, distinguished colleagues, uh, and friends who have joined us today uh, for this webinar on understanding the fractured landscape of violent extremism uh, in the Lake Chad Basin. Uh, now, I would like to pass it over to our director, uh, Amanda Dory, to say a few words about the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Thank you so much, Dr. Bukharis, and good day. Bonjour, bon dia, assalamu alaikum, siku and zori. That's all I have for this morning. I'll keep adding uh, greetings as, as, as I can. But it's such a pleasure to greet you from Africa Center for Strategic Studies here on the campus of the National Defense University in Washington, DC on what is a rainy gray morning for us. We're delighted to be joining an outstanding panel to discuss violent extremism in the Lake Chad Basin with participation from Africa Center alumni from all over the continent. In the registrations, we have more than 50 different countries represented. As Dr. Bukars mentioned, my name is Amanda Dory, and it's my honor to serve as Africa Center's director since uh, July of, of this year. As you know, Africa Center was chartered more than 20 years ago by the US Congress, and we conduct academic programs and research related to the broad range of security challenges on the African continent. The vision that we're working towards is security for all Africans that's championed by effective institutions that are accountable to their citizens. The program today is conducted in support of that vision and using our methodology when it comes to dialogue, peer learning, as well as seeking to catalyze strategic solutions. Before I turn you back over to Dr. Bukars, just a quick reminder that our website continues to publish all of our latest research. It's www.africacenter.org. Of potential interest to this group, we have a new very data-rich piece on the five zones of militant Islam in the Sahel. We also have a new piece on mapping disinformation campaigns in Africa, as well as a terrific interview with the AU's youth envoy, Chido Impemba. So please check them out if you haven't had an opportunity to do so. Thank you again, and let me turn it back over to Dr. Bukars to lead us forward. Thank you. Um, thank you, Amanda. Now let's, let's begin our session um, on understanding the fractured landscape of violent extremism in the Lake Chad Basin. <laughs> As you know, the Lake Chad uh, region has long been plagued by, uh, by poor governance, by underdevelopment, uh, marginalization, uh, and environmental pressures. And this context of uh, historical neglect, of deprivation, economic inequality, has provided fertile ground for the emergence of violent extremist groups who present themselves as challengers to a venal and unsalvageable status quo. And today we have uh, Jamaat uh, al-Sunnah al-Dawa wa Jihad, GIS, also known as, as Boko Haram, and the Islamic State Splinter Group. Uh, they represent a determined, dynamic, uh, and adaptable threat. I mean, to be sure, their resilience has been seriously tested by Nigerian and allied military pressure, uh, as well as the group's own internal <laughs> power struggles. So over the past decade, uh, Boko Haram has been riven by personality clashes, ideological disputes, uh, and contrasting strategies. And since the groups found them in 2002, Boko Haram has experienced two splits. The first occurred in 2012, and led to the creation of Jamaat Ansar al Muslimin fi Biladi Sudan, better known as Ansar. And the second breakup happened in 2016 with the establishment of the so called Islamic State uh, in West Africa province, ISWA, which has also seen its own factional leadership struggles. So the recent deaths of uh, uh, the leaders of Boko Haram and ISWAP factions 
have, have, have called into question their ability to sustain their organizational coherence and their operational capabilities. However, each faction's ability to regroup and adopt you know, has been amply demonstrated in the past. So this webinar today, it will help us explore the evolving trajectory of violent extremism in the Lake Chad Basin to better understand the continued threat that it poses in the region and then the ways forward for response. And we have three distinguished panelists that will help us gain a better understanding of the reconfiguration of violent extremist forces in the Lake Chad Basin, especially after the death of uh, Abu Bakr <clears throat> Shikau and the leader of, of, of ISWA. So their analysis will provide insights into the composition, the motivations and the objectives, as well as the inner workings and the enabling factors of the most powerful faction of violent extremist groups uh, in the Lake Chad Basin, namely the so-called Islamic State in uh, West Africa province, Islam. I think they will also uh, help bring clarity <clears throat> uh, to the political economy of violent extremism in the Lake Chad Basin and the implications for stabilization response. So without further ado, let's, um, let's introduce our panelists. So I'll start with Dr. Akinola <clears throat> Onojo, and he's the project manager of the Lake Chad Basin Program at the Institute for Security Studies, ISS. And he joined the ISS in 2018 as a senior researcher in the Transnational Threats and International Crime Program in Pretoria before moving to the ISS uh, Dakar office. And before joining ISS, he was a visiting scholar at the Institut d'études politiques Sciences Po uh, in France, where he taught on violence and terrorism in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Dr. Lojo is also a visiting research fellow at the International Center for Counterterrorism in The Hague, and he has a PhD from the University of Paris Descartes. Uh, so welcome. Uh, we have also Dr. <clears throat> Jumu Ayandeli. Um, she's a postdoctoral research fellow at New York <clears throat> University Center for the study of Africa and the African uh, diaspora, and she's a non-resident fellow at the Center for Global Affairs. And in her most recent uh, position as a senior researcher at ACLED, the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, Dr. Ian Daly supported the production of real-time data on political violence uh, in Nigeria. She's very passionate about understanding the dynamic relationship and the intersection between African governance, the human development, and political stability. And she has won numerous awards and grants uh, to conduct her, her, um, her brilliant uh, uh, research. And she holds a PhD in global affairs from Rutgers uh, State University of New Jersey. <clears throat> so welcome to you. And then we have Dr. J.D. Okeke. It is currently the, he's currently the coordinator of um, the regional program of Africa at UNDP. Uh, for over a decade, he served as a peace and security expert working for leading uh, research think tanks and, and the African Union Commission as head on, of policy on peace operations. And he holds a PhD in development uh, politics from Leeds University and MA in conflict resolution from Bradford and MPA from the Harvard uh, Kennedy School. So with that, let's start with, uh, with you, Akinola. So as, as you know, and as you have in fact, uh, written on uh, major developments in 2021 uh, modified the conflict trajectory in the Lake Chad Basin. And among them was uh, obviously the death of uh, Abu Bakr Shikal, leader of the Boko Haram faction GIS, Jamaat uh, Sunnah Lidawal Jihad. So can, can you explain to us uh, how you know Boko Haram organization and aims changed you know with the reconfiguration uh, of violent extremist forces in the Lake Chad Basin after the death of uh, Abu Bakr Shikau. Thanks very much Dr. Anwar and um, thanks to everyone who has taken time to connect. It's a pleasure to be with um, co-panelists. Um, the first thing to to note is that Abu Bakr Shikau's departure in mid 
2021, altered how people view the faction that he led, which is just what you just mentioned. And it altered it in relation to its objectives and relevance. Now, while Shekhar was alive, um, people got used to this uh, in a way of you know, scenes of appearance in propaganda videos that exploited Islam or religion you know, to justify Boko Haram's actions and you know, to make it seem like the group was engaged in a religious campaign of some sort. Now, since his death, Jazz has been preoccupied with the fight to maintain its existence and relevance in the face of a subtle and sometimes a violent attempt by ISWA, which is another faction, to absorb its members and take over its territories. So the leadership vacuum created by Shekau's death, um, especially the, you know, what we might call the spiritual leadership in a way, led to a fractionalization within what is left of the group. So for instance, there is someone referred to as Bakura Doro. Some of us may have read about him, you know, struggling to gain, you know, the allegiance of fighters previously directly under Shekau's command, um, particularly those in and around Sambiza Forest and, you know, the Mandara Mountains, you may have read about this or, or heard about this. Um, you know, Jazz, of course, still has fighters in the mountains. Um, Bakura Doro is, you know, for those who may not know, is based in Barwa in Niger Republic. And some of the fighters uh, in the meantime have also taken advantage of the fractionalization to also engage in criminal activities in the region. Now, the second point is that there have been internal disputes. And this has, of course, played into the hands of ISWA, which is now the main violent extremist group, not just in the Lake Chad Basin, but in West Africa. And this is very important because now we're going to be speaking about not just the LCD context, but the linkages with the wider Sahel. In fact, ISWAP's well-structured organization and the coordinated operations um, makes it comparably the favored violent extremist group um, for individuals you know, looking to join a strong group in the LCD. A third point is that the reconfigured landscape of the LCB was and still is characterized by waves of disengagement of individuals previously associated with Boko Haram. Now, this trend for some of us who have followed closely is most pronounced in Nigeria, but also in Cameroon, with thousands of you know, former fighters and associates leaving the group you know, in the wake of Shekau's death uh, you know, we have men, women, and children. Now, still speaking about the reconfiguration, um, ISWAP as a faction of Boko Haram has also steadily expanded the scope of its operations and attacks beyond what is, uh, you know, the well-known affected uh, Lake Chad Basin territories in Cameroon, Chad, uh, Niger, and Nigeria. And of course, the epicenter of this expansion is in Nigeria where Boko Haram, as we know, originated. Um, and the evidence of this expansion we're witnessing, especially in the current year, you know, has been observed in attacks masterminded uh, by the group in the Northwest and the North Central zones of Nigeria. So for those familiar with the geography of Nigeria, um, we may have heard of Kano, um, Kogi State, uh, Niger State within Nigeria. The Federal Capital Territory, of the country has also not been spared. And um, for those who may have read in the media, back in July, there was an assault on the correctional center in Abuja, which is the country's capital. And this led to you know, the escape of over 800 detainees. And as we speak, it's reported that over 400 are still at large. Now, when we speak about an expansion on this same point, it's important to you know, understand that there are implications. And if we take, for instance, the attack I just mentioned on the Correctional Center, one is that it highlights a threat to Nigeria's capital city and of course the wider region. Um, the second is that it points to the degree of coordination by the group or this faction and a trend that may foreshadow even future incidents if security measures are not taken seriously. Now, recently, um, 
regarding, you know, we, we've come across reports regarding a prominent member of Viswap's leadership, Albanawi, who is actually reported to be the leader, um, being elevated to the level of the global shura, which is sort of an advisory council for the so-called of the so-called Islamic State. And this development, if valid, also confers on ISWAP the ability to coordinate activities of the so-called Islamic State, uh, its franchises beyond the Lake Chad Basin region. And based on the data um, that, that we have, there are talks to make Albanawi uh, the head of ISIS in Africa. And this may be a testament of ISWAP's success despite military countermeasures against the group. Now, let me co conclude um, with this final point. Um, and it's the fact that we may be observing potential mergers between and among ISWAP, Jazz, and Ansaru that you mentioned earlier, Anwar. Um, from what we're observing, and of course, this can always be altered you know, as the trend unfolds, um, there are indications of mergers you know, that can be discerned in the way uh, these factions have provided opportunistic support to each other as they operate and inspire attacks. And a merger between any of these three factions has implications for a spillover of violent extremism in the LCD and even the wider Sahel. So Ansaru, for instance, is affiliated with the Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb. In fact, some of us may remember that at the start of this year in January, um, there was a uh, a restatement or an emphasis by the group uh, mentioning that it's still aligned with you know, the Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb. And then on the other hand, we have ISWAP that owes allegiance to ISIS. Now, Jazz, on its own part, in recent months, reportedly reached out to ISIS, leading ISIS action or sort of making ISIS to nudge ISWAP, its own affiliates, towards an alliance with Jazz. And if this takes shape in the coming period, if it takes shape, a merger can lead to a consolidation of fighters and resources. It can also lead to greater control of economic activities in the already affected communities. Um, it may create more access to financial resources. And of course, there will be implications down the line uh, in terms of the scale of recruitment in the lecture basin region. So I'll stop here since I think seven minutes is probably up. Thank you. No, that, that's excellent. I mean, you outlined the, I mean, several trends that, that followed the death of, of, of Shikaro. One of them is the, you know, the, the consolidation of the so-called Islamic State West Africa province, uh, ISWAP. Uh, you know, the, the comeback of, of Ansaro, which is affiliated with AQIM. Uh, the desertions uh, uh, of of disaffected uh, members, uh, the potential of mergers, obviously, and and and, and consolidation. So so here we are. I mean, the death of Chicago in May 2021 should have been, uh, you know, a celebrated end to the to his reign of terror uh, of uh, in the region. And instead, you know, we have these these new developments. Uh, and particularly, I want to focus on on ISWAP, which has consolidated its its presence you know, in, in, in the region. So you've already started discussing this, this group, but if you can just delve a little bit deeper and outline for us the membership structure of, of ISWAP and, and, and how significant, you know, are the place and role of, of women and youth in this structure? Uh, thanks, Anwar. Um, you know, this is a real subject. I'll try to summarize the details in, in the short period I have. Now, ISWAP is structured in a way that makes it easy to operate as an organization. So even if a leader is killed, at the top of the organization is the Shura Council, which is the highest decision-making body with representation drawn from different departments within the group. Now, the head of the Shura is usually the ISWAP leader who is accorded the privilege of having the final say on any issue. Um, our data shows that Albanawi is the head of the Shura Council. I mean, some of us may have heard some months ago that he was injured, but from what we've gathered, he has recovered. Um, I must also mention that ISWAP has, you know, four provinces in the LCD, and each has its own wali, like a governor of some sort. Now, within ISWAP, 
there are different departments or units um, that all work together to keep ISWAP functioning. Um, the biggest or you know, most important unit is the fighting force headed by an Amiru Jesh, who is sometimes regarded as ISWAP's de facto second in command. Um, there are other units within ISWAP that include, uh, you know, related to finance, uh, the morality police or HISBA, um, judiciary, secret police, and then traders. Now, in terms of the youth, which is a very important category, um, even outside the context of violent extremism, um, they are recognized as the bedrock of ISWA, which explains why most of the fighters are young men including the senior commanders. Some of us may have seen the videos online at some point, and you look at their faces, you can almost get a sense that these are very young individuals, sometimes in their twenties or even younger. Now, it is for this purpose that the group has, you know, it has a special, you know, we can call it a radicalization program for young boys called Darul Quran. You know, many SWAP commanders are products of this system including those working in the protection service of some senior commanders and leaders of the group. Now, regarding women, they play a very limited role within ISWA. I mean, to the best of what we know, um, all leadership positions are held by men. Women are prevented to a large extent from interacting with men, uh, especially publicly. Um, and this partly explains you know, the absence of women in the even the commercial system of the group. So um, I'll, I'll stop here. I don't want to go beyond five or so seven minutes. Thank you. Well, that's excellent. Thank you for the, the, the details on, on the role that, that youth obviously play and, and the limited role that, that women play in the, in the organization. That, that's very helpful. I think that, that will make a good transition to, to you, uh, uh, Jumo, if you can just uh, continue on this, on this line. Uh, on ISWAP, and if you can, you know, highlight for us some of the uh, key facets of ISWAP's war economy and income generation, uh, and what parts do you know women play in in the group's economic endeavors? And can you provide some some specific examples for us? Uh, thank you, Dr. Anwar, for the question. Um, and I think I want to begin with. Um, the context of the Lake Chad Basin. When we think about this area, what really comes to mind is the Boko Haram insurgency, um, including the many factions um, such as ISWAP. But prior to the group's emergence, prior to the group's um, insurgency, it's very important to recognize that the Lake Chad Basin was a thriving commercial hub um, with cross-border community interactions and trade. And even though these communities are separated by physical borders, ISWAP has really been able to expand and control economic activities by taking advantage of these shared cultures and traditions that have continued to foster um, interaction um, between communities. With this context in mind, how does the group generate income? Um, ISWAP generates income with four main sources. The first one being taxation. So when we think about fishing, livestock, and farm produce, these are the main sources of ISWAP um, income in, in that community in the Lake Chad Basin region. The group controls fishing activities in the waters, does not allow for you know, independent or individual fishing. And what this means is that prospective fishers are usually forced to liaise with ISWAP before fishing. And when they do have um, their, their fishes or, or, or their produce, these um, products are taxed, um, especially when they're transported out of the villages and the islands to local markets in Nigeria, Niger, Chad, um, and Cameroon. We also see the same taxation model leveled uh, on produces and livestock in the area that the group controls. And I think it's important for us to distinguish between this taxation model and zakat, which is you know, voluntary contributions that also inform the income generating um, activities of ISWAP. Now, the second revenue source from ISWAP comes from um, kidnapping for ransom activities. And the group focuses on humanitarian actors, government officials, security forces, and non-Muslims. 
And in negotiating ransoms, ISOP has really proven to be brutal, especially when its deadlines are not met. So when we look at the data in 2022 from the armed conflict location and event database, we see that there have been at least 17 of these incidents. Um, and they are in areas such as Gubao and Mongonu in Nigeria, as well as um, Fatokol in Cameroon. Um, the third research, um, revenue source is from looting. So, and also raids on communities and um, robbing travelers of their belongings at, at checkpoints. And we've seen this in um, Dabua and Manuk in Chad and um, Nigeria respectively. And we've also seen a lot of raids in rural and hard to reach areas in um, Cameroon's far north. Um, region. Uh, and, you know, some have argued, and the data also shows that this decision to raid communities is because of um, military operations um, by regional forces such as the MNJTF to limit ISWAP's access to their logistics as well as their supply um, routes. Finally, um, ISWAP has increasingly engaged um, in economic activities directly. And I would say that this is because of two factors. Um, the first being the movements need to actually be flexible and adapt, seeing that you know, government agencies as well as um, security um, forces have limited their logistics and supply routes. And the second being these avenues for opportunities, seeing that the Lake Chad Basin region has always been a thriving um, um, economic um, hub uh, for communities as well as um, border um, 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 regions um, in, in the Lake Chad Basin. So for example, ISWAP is said to have boats that it leases to um, community members um, for fishing activities or um, to transport goods uh, and um, produce. And these are obviously um, rented and you know they get money from it. So when it comes to the type and the amount of revenue that ISWAP um, is generating, they're generating huge, huge amounts. And there isn't necessarily um, a particular number that you can point out to, but there are estimates. And it's estimated that the, the group makes almost $50 million a year, especially when we look at um, the data from 2020 to 2020. 2021. But in really understanding the war economy of ISWAP, it's not just to look at the income generating activities, but also what the group is spending um, money on. And we have seen that, you know, with ISWAP, it spends almost two thirds of its revenue on, you know, paying off fighters and in also launching attacks against um, government um, officials. Um, with that said, what role do um, women play, which is the second part of this um, question. And even though women play limited roles um, in um, leadership position, as my panelist, um, Dr. Akiola has pointed out, um, when it comes to farming, when it comes to trading, women are playing increasingly um, prominent roles um, in this income generating activities. And it's important to recognize that because when we think about women um, in relation to jihadist groups such as ISWAP, we usually think of them as victims, but some have shown to be willing participants in ISWAP's activities. So um, for ISWAP to be able to take out produce and you know, transport them to local markets, they need intermediaries. Um, and some women have served as said intermediaries. While some are you know, coerced, others are willing participants because of the incentives um, that they get from, um, from these types of um, commercial activities. And they've also supplied ISWAP by bringing products and produce from local markets in to um, ISWAP territory. Um, with that said, I think I will stop um, there. Um, I know we have a lot of questions um, with regards to the political economy of ISWAP and I'm you know, willing to go into more details um, for any particular uh, sections that we want more information on. No, thank you. Uh, your description and details of this uh, you know, taxation system that, that ISWAP has, has, um, you know, has, has installed uh, you know, through uh, you know taxation of fish, livestock, uh, zakat, the uh, how they mount uh, you know checkpoints for the purposes of looting, uh, robbing, and abducting uh, 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 passengers, and how they deal really with the thorny issues of uh, you know the the spoils of, of war and, and and the rights of, of, of fighters. And there is a distinction between obviously a swap and 
and, uh, and 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 Boko Haram uh, in 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 this in this regard. So now let's go to the to the second question on on ISWAP's you know governance structure, um, which which I think includes uh, some form of community <clears throat> engagement. I mean, uh, we know or we have heard about you know ISWAP's role in. A role in settling local disputes through uh, so-called uh, Sharia courts. I mean, it's uh, punishment of uh, cattle rustlers and other thieves, and 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 through those activities, you know, it has I think won the group uh, some degree of of acceptance from from locals, and and this is a main distinction between the approaches taken uh, by ISWAP and and uh, GA, uh, GAS. Um, ISWAP also, from what we have seen, has generally refrained from the kind of, I think, extreme abuses that the Chikau, you know, indulged in, uh, you know, notably the forced marriages of, of women and, and, and girls, etc. Uh, obviously, ISWAP has not shied away from cruelly punishing those it sees as contravening its interpretation of Sharia or, or those, obviously, that it deems as, as, as enemies. So, so Jumu, if you can, uh, you know, dig deeper uh, on this so-called, you know, governance model of, of ISWAP, I think that would be very helpful. Uh, definitely. Um, and as you've pointed out, ISWAP has been um, waging a campaign of winning the hearts and minds of local communities. And it's really generate, um, generally maintained uh, a welcoming attitude towards um, Muslims in the communities that it controls, and yes, you correctly pointed out that you know it abstains from the kind of abuses that the jazz faction is known for, such as you know kidnappings and forced marriages of um, women and girls, as well as the forced recruitment of um, boys. Um, and you know, Iswap also you know having punished is um, fighters that have committed you know unauthorized um, abuses. But this is not to say that the group is less violent than jazz. Um, you know, ISWAP is still ruthless to, you know, non-Muslim populations in the Northeast. And it, you know, um, punishes those that it sees as breaking its own interpretation of um, Sharia law. Um, and yet we have seen that in communities that they control, the group spent a lot of money on humanitarian activities. And this includes, you know, taking care of less privileged um, community members, such as orphans, wounded fighters, the families of wounded fighters killed in battle, um, widows, the elderly, and other um, vulnerable persons. And they have provided resources, especially with their direct economic activities, such as food, water, medicine, and money to traders who actually suffer losses or lose their businesses in military raids by um, security forces. All of these efforts are intended to serve as a message. And what is this message? That if communities join and support the group, they will be taken care of. Uh, these resources are supposed to empower community members and have really, really been crucial in expanding ISWAP's reach, especially in the last um, um, year and a half. So it's really no surprise that for many living in this hard to reach rural areas, ISWAP is being seen as able to provide them with a better life, especially when compared to the life um, offered after surrendering to security forces. So this alleged um, human rights abuses and the perception of security forces benefiting from this crisis at the expense of civilians are unfortunately encouraging many community members to return back to this ISWAP um, controlled enclave. So when compared to the state, ISWAP is being viewed as um, fairer, which regrettably is a primary marker of and you know a contributing factor to its success in the last um, year and a half. <laughs> Thank you, excellent, excellent points, and it's good you, you highlighted again that the fact that that ISWAP obviously has not shied away, <clears throat> you know, from uh, targeting uh, civilians, uh, in some cases massacring civilians, you know, that are uh, you know either non-Muslim or that are supported, that are suspected, obviously of supporting the government or in communities that refuse to pay taxes or communities that that, uh, that disobey uh, uh, orders, uh, obviously. So it is still a, a violent uh, uh, group, no doubt, no doubt about it. Uh, but also the group, you know, has, 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 has made uh, 
uh, has invested uh, quite heavily, as as you nicely, I think, uh, outlined. You know, humanitarian uh, grounds. Uh, uh, it has continued to assure civilians that they are somewhat safe in the territory that this group uh, controls. Uh, uh, and in fact, you know, we have uh, read in the you know several reports that you know residents of 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 those places you know that Iswap controls. I mean, they report that movements uh, are indeed easier than in in government controlled uh, areas where security checks can be intrusive and and can be uh, uh, cum cumbersome. So so there is a, a relative uh, co cohabitation here with with populations. You know that uh, uh, in the rural areas under its its control, and that's a primary marker of, uh, and 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 in fact, it's a contributor to the relative success. You know of 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 this group here. So the challenge now is, as Iswap continues to expand, you know this, uh, if we want to call it governance model, obviously, uh, to to other chunks of of rural Borno and 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 elsewhere here, right? Then. Uh, then what then what happens? So now let's move to the our third third panelist, uh, Gidi. and and the question um, for you and uh, uh, you know Akinola uh, talked briefly about it is that major trend that was triggered by the death of Shikao has been you know that mass exodus of former. Uh, Boko Haram associates from the group. So, so the question is how how do you manage this in a context where you know the Lake Chad Basin countries, Nigeria, Cameroon, etc., you know they they have inadequate resources uh, and capacity for proper screening, for proper profiling, you know, for prosecution, rehabilitation, and and reintegration. Uh, of former uh, Boko Haram associates. How do, you, how do you manage that? Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ano, and it's a pleasure to be connected uh, with uh, my very good friends and panelists. Uh, they seem to have provided uh, a forensic analysis of what seems to be the context uh, and the political economy uh, that is evolving in the region. I, I think the question you raised uh, also implies uh, two sub questions. I think the first is what is uh, beyond the death of Shekau, uh, how are we beginning to understand uh, uh, what is driving this pathway out of extremism? I think this is really a fundamental problem to address. Uh, and the second question is that what do we do about it uh, in light of some of the constraints that you have uh, identified? And, and uh, we have been thinking about this uh, at UNDP, and very soon we will be uh, publishing uh, a, a groundbreaking report on pathways out of extremism, uh, where we have interviewed over 2,000 respondents that have recently disengaged from uh, Boko Haram, uh, but also from other uh, violent extremist groups. In fact, uh, beyond the Lake Chad Basin, uh, we've identified uh, four other countries outside of the region uh, where we've gathered our evidence. And, and four main drivers uh, seem, to, uh, to, seem to be emerging from the research. Uh, the first is what would not surprise most of our audience today on unmet expectations. So most of those uh, that we interviewed as part of this research uh, we found that there is a correlation between uh, unmet expectations, a positive correlation, uh, and uh, of course, uh, the uh, motivation to leave uh, particular violent extremist groups. And I think this is quite an important point. Uh, the second point, uh, which seems to be emerging from our study, is, is the whole question around jobs. Uh, out of the over 2,000 respondents, uh, about 54% of those that we interviewed uh, seem to have underscored the importance uh, of not finding uh, job employment opportunities, or in fact, the governance structures which you referred to 
was not providing the right quality of jobs. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, they were beginning to get very disenfranchised, uh, very disenchanted uh, about, uh, of course, uh, the, the promise of these violent extremist groups. Uh, the third point uh, is around grievances. And, and I think this is a point that is a paradox in many ways, because uh, on one hand, we see that grievances drives people into violent extremist groups, as we noted in our 2017 report, but we are also seeing that grievances are also contributing to uh, keeping people or making people want to leave uh, violent extremist groups. And, and last point is around ideology. You know, uh, it, it seems to me that uh, from the research evidence that we, we have, uh, that quite a number of the groups are leaving because they no longer believe in the ideology which uh, seem to have uh, inspired uh, their joining uh, uh, these violent extreme, extremist groups in the first place. So when you take a combination of these factors, uh, you begin to see why we are seeing this increasing number of uh, 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 disengaged fighters from violent extremist groups. So what does it mean uh, for policy? And, and that's the other part of the question. I think there are three things that this brings to, to fore. The first is that there is a need for strong political support uh, that is anchored on balancing uh, humanitarian priorities. And we see that the humanitarian needs, including what my fellow panelists have just mentioned, uh, is still very much compelling. Uh, but we are also seeing the need to prioritize development responses, development responses that help to effectively uh, uh, manage uh, people uh, uh, trying to leave violent extremist groups. Uh, the second point is the whole notion of uh, support to uh, transitional justice mechanisms. And I think this is one that is important because it has to be rooted uh, in local mechanisms. And that is why we are currently working with the Regional Stabilization Secretariat uh, to begin to map existing traditional justice mechanisms in the Lake Chad Basin and to identify linkages uh, with, uh, of course, formal justice uh, sector in the region. And, and the last point is around financing. Financing of uh, reintegration uh, is both a humanitarian but a development imperative. And it shouldn't be a choice between one or the other. If we're thinking about 3.3 uh, million uh, uh, displaced persons of OCHA, as OCHA has mentioned, that require support. Of course, humanitarian inv investment is always going to be important. But at the same time, as we see these growing numbers of disengaged fighters, the, uh, the, the priority also has to be this proportionate investment in, de in, in development in such a way that you can ensure that you promote livelihood opportunities for people and ensure safe return. And, and that is why we constantly have to work with government uh, uh, to ensure that this happens. I think there is a model that is emerging uh, from the Lake Chad Basin, especially in the Boro in Borono State where uh, the, the governor of the state seemed to have a strong uh, uh, political determination of, or motivation to provide a safe and secure return of some of these uh, former fighters. Uh, back to you, Anu, and I look forward to further questions. Absolutely. Ex excellent points again, the, and this uh, the necessity to understand why why people di disengage. I mean, their choices and and their and their strategies, and it's fascinating. I mean, some of the points that that you raised. Uh, and and what the evidence points to uh, in terms of of disengagement. Disengagement is triggered, you know, by obviously personal, uh, but also by a broader set of um, of, of of logics. Uh, uh, you mentioned the issue of grievance, disillusionment. How individuals who join this group, uh, you know, because of several promises, right? Uh, Socioeconomic uh, ascension, uh, justice, protection. Obviously, how they became disappointed. Uh, with the group, the difficult conditions, obviously, within the group, uh, there is the misalignment, obviously, of objectives of those that, that joined, you know, uh, and what, what the group's objectives, obviously, is there's disillusionment, you said, with ideology, it's uh, very interesting, that dissonance between, you know, that recruitment messaging and and what the group actually, you know, does, and, and how that has led, obviously, to uh, 
uh, to this disillusionment with the uh, with the group's uh, uh, ideology, I know Akinola would, would love to to join here uh, as well. Uh, they have authored a fascinating report on on this particular on this particular topic, and and then you went on 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 the necessity to to try, I mean, to to address this, stop political support. Uh, uh, you know how you prioritize development responses. The issue of, of transitional justice. You're absolutely right because the issue of reintegration raises this difficult dilemma of transitional justice and 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 reconciliation here. Uh, despite the consensus that to have lasting peace, you, you know, you need the involvement of communities in in the reintegration uh, uh, process. Uh, Process here. So let's go to the to the to the second uh, uh, question here. And again, you started addressing this with regard, obviously, to the issue of uh, uh, of, of how do you demobilize and and, and, and reintegrate, rehabilitate, reintegrate. What are the best approaches, you know, to to stabilize uh, the Lake Chad base, based obviously on the work that that you have done and that UNDP has been uh, has been doing. Thanks again, a very relevant question. I, I, I think, uh, you know, for too long, uh, there has been very elastic definition of stabilization. Uh, and in many ways, I, I think it's a spectrum. On one hand, you have uh, uh, stab stabilization narrowly defined as, uh, as part of, uh, uh, you know, military operations. And on the other hand, we're seeing that there is stabilization uh, 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 concept, well, the definition of stabilization is increasingly being defined uh, in a development context where mm -hmm. it complements uh, both the security investment that is being made on the ground and and some of the, the necessity for non-security mm -hmm. uh, investment or, or what you can say the promotion of human security in many ways. And, and, and I think uh, we're seeing a model emerge uh, in, in the Lake Chad Basin uh, in the form of the implementation of the Regional Stabilization Facility, uh, which was established in 2019. And, and the facility directly contributes uh, to the uh, Regional Stabilization Strategy, which was endorsed uh, by the African Union Peace and Security Council. And, and this, the, the, what we see is that the strategy contributes or does three things, uh, the facility that we deployed. Um, the first is that we are seeking to provide community security. Um, so beyond the emphasis on military operations, there's also a need uh, to promote uh, community policing uh, in areas that have been recently stabilized, stabilized or areas that have been recovered by MNJTF or National Security Forces from, uh, from Boko Haram. I think this is really going to be important. The idea that uh, military operation will provide a, a solution uh, to long-term stability. Stability is a myth. Uh, you have to always uh, ensure that there's that complementarity with, uh, you know, policing requirements on the ground. The second thing uh, which uh, the facility does is that we are also providing basic infrastructure to communities in this lo location. And I think you made the point earlier on when you talked about the governance model of, 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 of these violent extremist groups. It has to be uh, replaced with a better governance model that provides services to, to uh, conflict affected uh, population. And, and the third objective of the facility is to establish uh, livelihood opportunities. So beyond providing basic infrastructure, we are also providing uh, livelihood opportunities to uh, communities that are affected by, by the conflict uh, in the region. And what we have seen over the last three years, uh, based on uh, the data that we have gathered, is this positive correlation between uh, stabilization programming on the ground as defined, as I've just defined, and reduced violence and sustained security in those areas where stabilization uh, programming has been uh, sustained. Um, uh, but it's important to under, uh, you know, to emphasize that, you know, stabilization programming cannot be done in isolation uh, of the political support that is a necessity uh, at uh, the regional level 
uh, but also at the sub-regional level. So working with local administration would always be important. Working with the governors of the affected states would always be important. Ensuring that you are able to align the decisions made uh, by continental uh, institutions like the African Union and sub-regional entities like the Lake Chad Basin would constantly be relevant in, in, in ensuring that the political, the overarching political strategy uh, is consistent with the stabilization operations on the ground. The second thing that is important to note that there has to be that alignment between security uh, interventions on the ground and, and what is, you know, the development actors are doing in terms of stabilizing the region. And we have seen that historically there has been that gap where you conduct you know, offensive operations and, and there is a vacuum. And what that vacuum does is that it, you do not win the hearts and minds of population because in, in many ways, they potentially are better off uh, under the control of a violent extremist group than they were when the areas have been liberated uh, by those uh, violent extremist groups. So it's always going to be important that uh, you, you have to replace uh, that you know, illegitimate uh, governance model with a governance model that seeks to establish uh, you know, and strengthen the social contract between the state and, and, and its citizens. And, and so far, uh, we think that it is working, but there's an inherent risk associated with the stabilization programming in the Lake Chad Basin. And, and the risk that we find is that uh, because of limited resources and because of limited security in the region, we seem to be um, uh, providing these islands of stability. So, so specific areas are being stabilized uh, uh, and other areas are still high risk as some of my panelists mentioned. Uh, so for you to achieve sustainable peace, uh, you, could, you cannot just uh, focus on you know, particular uh, uh, zones of stability. It's important that we begin to think about how do you expand a stabilization program in beyond uh, the concentration of you know, these programs in specific areas. Uh, I think that is a challenge uh, that we face now. And the second challenge that I find when you're doing stabilization work is how do you, what is your exit strategy? Uh, so stabilization is not expected to be a long-term uh, plan. Uh, so what you intend to do is to ensure that you, you create the foundation and the foundation then provides a basis for early recovery and long-term development investments. And, and, and for that to happen, there has to be resources and capacity, capacities to be able to ensure that alignment. Uh, we, the, the initial uh, envisioning of our stabilization program in, in the Lake Chad Basin was for an 18 month period. Uh, it's now been extended but we should not risk having a protracted extension of stabilization. It can never replace the necessity for promoting governance investments, but also uh, development investments in the region. Back to you and thank you so much. Thank you, uh, uh, GD. Excellent, um, excellent remarks there, insights. Uh, so again, thank you to, to the panelists uh, for their excellent uh, uh, insights from their work on, on these critical uh, issues. Uh, thank you all for, uh, thank you to the participants for following the conversation. I hope you found it obviously useful. So some of the main points that, that I picked is, is that we need to go beyond the military uh, uh, engagement, obviously. Uh, you know, the intelligence gathering and, and sharing, you know, the uh, investment in investigations and, and all of that is, is, is really uh, critical here. We need better border management and, and security uh, because violent extremist groups, they take advantage of porous and, and supervised borders. Uh, you know, technology uh, is, is also uh, uh, important here, but equally important is, and this is GD and, and all of you, frankly, is that, you know, states in Lake Chad Basin, they, they have to, to step up, uh, you know, their efforts in in, in investing in prevention efforts that, that thwart uh, ISWAP and, and other VE actors recruitment drive, both ideologically and non-ideologically, uh, obviously. So there has to be, uh, there must be a credible and better alternative to, to what the group is, is offering here, to use Jumu's words, 
that uh, efforts to win the hearts and, and minds of, of, of civilians. So you have to look at the, the social contract here of, of, of the people. So, so strengthening that is, is extremely important, uh, not only to dissuade people from the pathway you know, out of violent extremist groups, but also to prevent them from joining these extremist groups in, in, in the first place. Uh, and this requires obviously several things, the increased government, spread, uh, government uh, presence in remote areas, which should translate into more security, provision of alternative livelihoods, uh, uh, access to basic and, and uh, services like healthcare, education, portable water, uh, and obviously respect for um, uh, for, uh, for 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 human for human rights here. Uh, so while waiting, you know, for the the the, the questions, uh, the one I, I I have, you know, and I know Akinola also wants to get here on the you know the the rehabilitation <clears throat> uh, part here. So so desertions, what you have all said is is definitely a boon in the war against Boko Haram. But they have to be, uh, you know, managed well, right? Because if if they are, then that would be an effective way of reducing the base of these violent extremist groups, and and also, you know, you you undermine the credibility of these groups, as GD nicely outlined here. You know how those that have left, at least some of them, are disillusioned, you know, with the with the group and and its ideology. So it's, it's an opportunity here. But to benefit from desertions, you know, states have developed, uh, Nigeria is an advance in this regard, national approaches, but that's not enough, right? We need a more collaborative regional approach, right, to, to a regional, regional problem here. And, and we have read uh, from Akinola's research, Gini's research, Umu, is that, you know, each of the Lake Chad Basin countries, they have registered ex-associates from one or more of the other countries. So obviously we need more collaboration and, and we need a, a sub-regional uh, approach here. And GD mentioned the, the, Lake, the African Union Lake Chad Basin Commission regional stabilization strategy. So, so how do, do we do that? I mean, based on, on your research, uh, you know, is there a regional approach? Uh, how effective is that? Obviously, a regional approach uh, has been, uh, and if not, then then what needs to be to be done? So I'll start with Akinola. I know he has a lot to say uh, on uh, in this uh, in this domain. Akinola. All right. Thank you very much, Anwar. Um, I think Dr. Gide already was uh, pointing us in the direction of what is known as the regional strategy for stabilization recovery resilience of the Boko Haram affected areas in the LCB. And why I'm, I'm also going to anchor my response on this is because within that strategy mm -hmm. is a strong um, indication of a regional approach to addressing this issue. So there's a pillar there, I think it's pillar three, which actually focuses specifically on this question you just raised. So we've seen thousands of people disengage, um, members, former associates, um, people who join for various reasons across genders. And this strategy provides basically an anchor or a framework that the four countries affected can actually formulate, cooperate, learn lessons, and implement some of what are already within the strategy. So for example, um, there are questions regarding enhancing of structures within these different countries. Um, the technical know-how, and even financially speaking, what is required to even engage in screening procedures and profiling, to be able to even distinguish among those who have disengaged, those who were high risk or who were actively involved in some of these groups or factions, and those who joined for reasons that perhaps did not necessarily um, uh, make them or find them uh, involved in some certain level of violence or, or engagement with these groups. People join for various reasons. So the screening component of this is very important and it requires resources. Now, um, 
one of the panelists mentioned, I believe Judy mentioned a point about um, the, I, I think he mentioned something about borders and you know, you Anwa mentioned tech solutions. And this brings us to the idea of the role of the private sector. Um, I think the private sector has an important role to play in all of this, because even if you look at the UN Security Council resolution 2396 from 2017, um, those who are familiar with this will know that it drew attention to the need for states to involve the private sector more deeply. And um, this point always comes up a lot, but then are we really uh, engaging in this? And I know to some extent aspects or, or sections of the private sector have um, contributed in terms of you know, humanitarian uh, needs being met and you know, rebuilding of, of certain facilities and so on. But I think we need to actually look at this in a more comprehensive way. So for instance, in East Africa, which is an example where we have even Al Shabaab, um, in Kenya, for instance, um, there's what we call the, the Silicon Savannah. Um, which really is a landscape of tech hubs. Uh, in West Africa or in the Lake Chad Basin, the Sahel, um, I do not think that it is impossible to bring together um, uh, tech uh, startups, perhaps to look at how they can play a role in terms of contributing to tech solutions um, that can help more effective border management, for instance. I think these are things we need to think about. And if I can just add perhaps to, to what has been said by the panelists, um, maybe the question about uh, not just disengagement now, but stabilization itself. Um, the point about supporting livelihoods is very important. There are other challenges of insecurity that were already occurring before Boko Haram. Um, today we are talking about banditry and abduction and so on. And I know the military has played a role in terms of um, actually, uh, you know, countermeasures or, you know, operations to try and bring down this trend. But I think these problems were things which Boko Haram and its factions grafted themselves to when this problem, when, you know, violent extremism really became a, a major issue. And intercommunal clashes have also been there. We shouldn't forget all this. But supporting livelihoods in terms of food security, climate related challenges, healthcare. Uh, I mean, education as a vehicle for empowerment and so on will collectively help, uh, you know, enhance the capacity of individuals who might otherwise be at, you know, vulnerable or at risk. And then finally, before I allow um, other panelists to speak, I think the point about transitional justice is also very important. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think it's a very um, useful framework for allowing us to look at the needs of communities. Um, we are looking at disengagement, yes, but then on the other side of the coin are communities affected who are seeing the way some who are disengaged are being treated and the welfare packages which they've enjoyed. But they, the communities, are still scarred by you know, the harm which they perceive some of these disengaged individuals have caused. So we need to look at the right to know the right to justice, reforming institutions and laws, and the right to reparations. So the whole, you know, the full range of processes that will allow society to sort of come to terms with the legacy of abuses and allow accountability is very important. And that is what we mean by, you know, when we speak about this transitional justice, uh, uh, you know, framing. Thank you. Sure. Th thank you, um, Akinola, and on this, uh, question of transitional justice in fact there is there is a question here uh by one of the the participants here uh so it's in 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 french i can read it in in english if i think the 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 question is the the issue of uh you know transitional um justice here is a a good um opportunity to have lasting peace in the lake chat basin obviously so wouldn't be wouldn't it be more effective if we combined you know uh the transitional justice you know to with efforts to how do you meet the reparation needs of of victims uh because that's how you know guarantee obviously of of regional 
of regional stability. So this 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 question was to uh, to, uh, to to GD uh, on the stabilization uh, program. One question uh, they want to 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 know what is the cultural dimension. I mean, of the peace and security stabilization program in in the Lake Chad in the Lake Chad basin here. Um, there is another question about ISWAP's expansion, it's expanding its activities to states like uh, Edo, Ondo, Kano, and, and Koji. So, so the question is, do you believe the group also aims to expand its models of, of governance and ideology to those areas, uh, or do the actions there fit differently you know, in, in, the group's, uh, in the group's strategy? So I think we'll we'll have these questions, and then uh, probably we will have time for for another round. I'm just looking here at the questions. So sure, I don't know whether uh, Jumu, if, if you want to start. I think I can answer the um, expansion question. Sure. Yeah. Um, and yes, you know we've seen ISOP activities in North Central and Nigeria as well as Southern Nigeria, but. Um, it doesn't have anything to do, in my own honest opinion, um, with the groups um, wanting to expand into these particular territories or regions, but as a show of power, being able to launch attacks and um, as a recruitment and mobilization um, tactic um, so that um, you know, potential recruits can see them as being more favorable to want to join. So, you know, there is competition in the Lake Chad Basin region and in the Sahel region, as um, um, Akiola has pointed out. Um, with these many competing groups, you have to um, make yourself attractive. And how do you do that? By showing that you have resources, that you are able to launch attacks in various countries, various regions, and that you are a force to be reckoned with um, by government officials, by international community representations, and by, by the media um, themselves. So I don't necessarily think it has anything to do with their governance um, structure or their ideology, but just as a means of showing power and also threatening state security forces to take a good look at them and show that they are expanding and they can expand with the resources that they have. Okay. All right. Excellent. JD? No, thank you very much. I think yeah. the question around the cultural dimension uh, of stabilization is an important one. But yeah, I, and I and I think uh, oftentimes uh, we we tend to conflate uh, a stabilization as um, uh, as uh, as part of the whole aid architecture where we are uh, providing relief uh, to communities affected by crisis. I think that is really. Um, uh, not what stabilization is. Stabilization gives agency to the people affected by this crisis. So from the outset, you are not, uh, you do not have agency over communities, but rather you are creating an enabling environment uh, that would ultimately uh, give agency back to individuals. So having agency, having communities employed, having them take ownership for their own security, uh, providing them with uh, opportunities that, that would allow for an actualization of, of their livelihood opportunities is one that ultimately contributes to uh, th this idea of giving back agency to communities. And so it's, it's a slight departure from this uh, state of uh, a permanent emergency that often characterize uh, uh, humanitarian assistance, and and that and whilst we have to contain, maintain, and uh, and constantly address the humanitarian needs on the ground, which are huge, by the way, um, as we begin uh, to think about that departure away. Uh, from uh, the, 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 this question around permanent emergency, the, the priority has to be uh, that, you know, prioritizing the agency of communities. And when you do that, uh, I think the cultural element would be addressed. I think that is the first point I need to make. The second point is around the inherent risk of, uh, of, of transposing uh, previous transitional justice mechanisms into the Lake Chad Basin. Um, uh, we should not predetermine the model that would work 
in the Lake Chad Basin. And that is why I agree with the approach that has been taken by uh, the, the Lake Chad Basin uh, Commission, which is to identify what the traditional justice mechanisms are and to see what alignment can be drawn uh, between traditional traditional justice mechanisms on the ground with the formal justice sector, right? Uh, I, I think that is a, an incremental way of ensuring that you can address two things. And I think uh, 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 Dr. Olojo mentioned that uh, you can address the needs of the victims and you can also uh, try to apply uh, justice in a way that also accommodates uh, the perpetrators. I think this is really an important point uh, because if we are trying to look at the justice model applied in places like South Africa or Sierra Leone or Rwanda and think that that would also apply the Lake Chad Basin, it might be a huge mistake. Thank you. In fact, you addressed one of the question uh, in, in, in the chat asking whether there is any lessons, there are any lessons to learn from South Africa, Rwanda and, and Sierra Leone. Uh, so we have a few more more questions, and and one is the um, uh, example of Ghana. They say Ghana has a comprehensive local governance system, uh, which is meant to uh, uh, you know eliminate, so to speak, the existence of ungoverned spaces. And by and large, this has been quite effective in allowing for a more equitable distribution of resources uh, across the country. So the idea is to have you know, at the community level, the inclusion in, in you know, governance as well as guidance on, on the real needs of the community in order to channel resources and, and identify impactful projects. So could the question is, could this be looked at as a, as a template or as an example, you know, to, to support governments to decentralize power more effectively to try to empower communities? Uh, do we need to rethink our governance uh, uh, structures? So that's the first question. Uh, the second question, and this is Akinola uh, addressed that, uh, not in detail, uh, but in, in the trends that he outlined with the death of Shikao, is how do you see the potential of uh, cooperation between Ansaro and, uh, and JNM? Uh, uh, and on the other hand, you know, Iswat and the so-called you know, Islamic State Sahel province here, right? Uh, or the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara. So what can the Nigeria-based groups provide the Sahel-based ones and vice versa? Uh, so is this geographic continuum of violent extremist activity between the Sahel and Lake Chad Basin a real possibility? Uh, and, and another question here on the, the JNTF. Uh, so, 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 so we have here you know, a body that is operating the question goes to support the, the national efforts of the countries in the Lake Chad Basin. So one approach the participant is asking is that th this, for need, this force needs to be made stronger. Uh, and, uh, and, and maybe the EU can, can, can reinforce the capacity you know, of this force. Uh, so with the aim to, to stabilize the region. So you know, three, uh, three, uh, three questions here. Um, so I'll pass it to uh, to you. I don't know whether two more you want to, to start. You can pick whatever question that, that you want to address. I, I can address um, the collaboration question. Okay. Um, and as you know, my esteemed and uh, my fellow panelist, Dr. Akiola, uh, pointed out that there is this real possibility of uh, mergers um, of a lot of these different groups in the Lake Chad and in Sahel, um, um, fusing uh, and learning from each other. And we've also seen this, we've seen this happen in Central Sahel um, between JNIM and um, the Islamic uh, State with them, uh, of the Greater Sahara. And even though there's fighting right now, you know, they have helped each other in expanding their zones of influence. And this can also um, transpose um, into the Lake Chad Basin um, region, especially with the growing influence of, um, of the iceberg fraction. And with that said, I, I want to say that it is very important, uh, especially 
um, for us that are gathered here, for African governments, for um, international representatives, um, for us to learn from each other. Um, the Lake Chad and the Central Sahel region are very close to each other, and countries such as Niger and Chad are part of the Lake Chad Basin and are part of the G5 Sahel. And we are dealing with the same sort of issues. So there is a need for us to collaborate and share information. The same way that these um, groups, these um, Islamist groups are learning from each other, we must also learn from each other um, and see what practices um, are working for us, which ones are not working, how we can improve um, our strategies, how we can improve our policies. Um, because we're African first, we're not Francophone, we're not Anglophone. Um, and um, this is very, very important in stabilization efforts and in really addressing um, a lot of the issues that we are seeing in these two regions. Okay, excellent. I'll go to, um, to Akinola. Uh, thanks very much. Um, since we're speaking about alignment and mm -hmm. merger, let, let me align myself with uh, what the panelists have said. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Jumo mentioned um, the potential of these mergers and learning lessons, even for those of us on the other side of this battle. And definitely it is very important because um, I mentioned earlier at the beginning of uh, the discussion that we have a case where um, one of these factions, Ansaru, which is affiliated to Al-Qaeda, and ISWAP, which owes allegiance to ISIS, you know, we see indications of opportunistic uh, you know, collaboration you know, in the countries where, of course, they are, they, are, they are based. We see alliances of convenience. To some extent, we see where even banditry is also integrated or those who are involved in banditry integrate themselves with what these factions are involved in. Now, we on the other side need to think in terms of how we can be a step ahead or even several steps ahead. So when we talk about the global coalition to defeat Daesh, yes, we have the regional stabilization strategy for the Lake Chad Basin, which is very, very important. And then you have other uh, regional entities but then at the global level, which of course involves African countries, the global coalition to TV Daesh provides a platform that allows all these countries, including Ghana, that's one of the participants uh, you know, rightly pointed out, including Ghana, including Iraq and Syria that were previously hubs for ISIS to be able to share lessons across regions or even continents. There were many foreign fighters or individuals who left Africa some years ago to join the ranks of ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Some of them returned, some did not. Now, there are from time to time occasions when all these countries are able to meet. Earlier this year in May, there was a, a ministerial meeting at Marrakesh in Morocco. It was the first ministerial meeting on African soil. And those kind of convenings allow all these countries, both those who are directly affected and those that are still sort of uh, on the out you know on the outside in a way but then we, we see some supply chains and things happening especially the coastal countries in, in west africa they can now share lessons and see how to coordinate in a more effective way that is why we have these platforms final point i want to make is to just add to what has been said about the, the traditional justice Point. And I think Dr. Jide already addressed this, but I just want to add that it is a very important um, dimension of, of any of these uh, solutions or strategies we're talking about, because it allows us to acknowledge the role of local communities. Communities are not oblivious of the solutions. Not only do they recognize the problems that they are having you know, to deal with, but they also have a clear idea of how to address it. Sometimes they might lack the agency or the empowerment, but then it does not mean they're oblivious. So when we speak about the community involvement or engagement, it means that we must have that conversation with them at that level, and it should actually start from them. And we should be gender sensitive when we're doing this, because a lot of times, even when we go into communities, there is a way women are sort of on the outside. We need to integrate everyone and including the youth as well. So I think this point is really key. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Akinola. Uh, Jiri, anything to add? Yes. Uh, first, I think investment in local governance is uh, also 
uh, investment in prevention. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and I think they are quite interrelated. And that is why uh, in, even if we think about the, the case of, of Ghana, uh, Ghana started first by investing in what was described at the time as the infrastructures for peace, uh, which then became uh, known as the National Peace Council. Um, and when you think about the evolution of this, what you find is that it is not a case of either or. Uh, it's a case of how do you invest in local governance, but how is that connected and you know, effectively aligned uh, with national level priorities? And I think Ghana has uh, been able to do uh, well uh, in, in that regard. The second point is that uh, increasingly, and I think one of the participants participant made that point, uh, there is uh, a greater investment in prevention in the Northwest Nigeria. Uh, we should not allow uh, some of the missed opportunities of the Northeast uh, reproduce themselves in the Northwest. Uh, and, and that is why uh, I don't see the crisis or the emerging situation in the Northwest as one that deserves uh, you know, disproportionate security investment. What we need to begin to do is to lay that foundation for strong uh, local uh, governance investments, which would serve as a, as a pre prevention uh, uh, option uh, for uh, communities. The second point I, I, I want to address is around the, uh, how do you evaluate the MNJTF? Uh, and, and I think as we mostly know, um, it was established uh, in 2015 uh, uh, by the African Union. Uh, and one of the biggest achievements in my view, uh, given that at the time I was working for the African Union of the MNJTF was the ability for the MNJTF to provide a political consensus around uh, cross-border operations. Um, uh, prior to the establishment of the MNJTF, this was, a, if, in fact, I would argue that this was the most difficult political question uh, to be resolved. But uh, over time, we have seen that there has been this promotion, uh, cooperation between countries uh, in the region uh, when it comes to cross-border uh, operations. I think uh, the AU is now having a reflection session. Uh, it's going to, I think they're having a meeting, a high-level meeting in Abuja, first to the 3rd of November in a few weeks uh, to review uh, some of the operations uh, that they have authorized or mandated over the last few years. I think it's going to be an opportunity Opportunity to further clarify uh, how far uh, the MNJTF has been able to achieve its mandate. Back to you. Okay, excellent. Um, well, I, I think uh, this would bring us to the to the end of, of this uh, um, conversation. Uh, I mean, several it was it was rich, uh, and I and I can do justice, obviously, to, to summarize in the, 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 the main points. Um, that were uh, that were discussed, uh, but 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 key is that the military component is is key, but it must be deployed as a complement to to efforts to improve state society uh, uh, relations. Uh, there has to be more emphasis on improving local governance, uh, uh, on investment in 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 in, in prevention. Uh, so there must be, as as we said throughout, I think, uh, credible and and better alternatives here. Uh, for the populations, uh, because states and, and their regional international partners obviously are in competition with, uh, with 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 these groups. So you have to offer something that is that is better to to win the the hearts and minds of of civilians. So so states should really take uh, a hard look at their social contracts with with the people, and strengthening that is is extremely critical um, in in preventing people from from joining. Uh, violent extremist groups. So it's it's important to demonstrate that that extremist groups do not have a monopoly on providing security and and and, and, and services here. Because uh, in the absence of peace and security, I mean, I mean obviously, uh, populations are often ready to to accept uh, any entity uh, that that offers them that offers them uh, stability. So thank you all for your participation in in this webinar. 
a big thank you to to our uh, uh, esteemed uh, uh, panelists, uh, you know, for their insights and, and excellent uh, uh, contributions. And um, for the participants, uh, please consider joining us again for the subsequent uh, webinars in this um, uh, quarterly series, which we will continue uh, moving moving forward. So thank you very much, and stay safe and stay well. <laughs>